going into 2016, everybody said this was going to be the year of monetary divergence. The ECB was supposed to ease more. The dollar was going to surge as the Fed uh, hiked rates. Uh, we only got one rate hike. How did that thesis hold up, the uh, divergence uh, call, in your view? Not very well, Joe. If anything, it's been the year of convergence. This was the year when collectively, for different reasons in different places, they all kind of discovered their own mortality. Hmm. This time last year, the dots projected four rate increases. Didn't happen, we got one. The BOJ was supposed to continue the Corota Bazooka doctrine. They pulled back, now they're just targeting the yield curve. ECB, Draghi's at pains to say it's not a taper. But it's also true, it's 60 billion a month, not 80. And the BOE, after their emergency cut after Brexit, are now like, well, hey, we could go either way. So for their own unique reasons, they're kind of ending up in the same place. And a lot of that is to hand things off to the governments, to wait for some kind of fiscal policy to, to come in and, and take the baton and run with it. Vince, uh, we're looking at a reflation trade across asset classes yeah. and certainly we're seeing that in currencies um, which of the pairs really reflects that the most I think um, I think dollar yen for the most part is the um, is the clearest signal it's it's moved a great deal uh, emerging markets as well but in the G10 space dollar yen is is the one where you still see this vast monetary policy divergence and we can still see a continuation of the dollar trend or the yen weaken even against its other pairs within the G10 space uh, the dollar long thesis, and you know, we were talking to, and Dan was talking about this convergence versus divergence. Almost everyone's long the dollar. It's very hard to find a contrarian view on that at the moment. Yeah. What is the contrarian argument? Well, the contrarian argument is, well, for the short term, we're going into the into a year end, which will likely bring dollar sellers with the equity markets performing the way they are. Uh, policy, uh, or rather, uh, Im imbalances within the asset managers would would suggest that there's going to be dollar selling into year end. Whether it's enough to quell this dollar bull trend, we don't know just yet. We'll see. The counter argument to everything is this is a bit of hopium mm. on Trump's fiscal policies. We're at near a $20 trillion deficit. Mitch McConnell was also already pushed back and not wanting um, tax cuts that are an offset elsewhere, he wants to see a neutral budget. So if you have the Senate Republican leader pushing back on potential big fiscal policy, what does that say what the Democrats are going to do and how hard is it for Trump to get these policies through? You know, I want to bring in a chart here. Um, Dan, this is uh, G7 inflation versus the trade-weighted dollar. If you come inside the Bloomberg, we can take a look at this chart. And w the idea here is inflation is picking up. Um, that's kind of been the theme since August, really, right? I mean, it, it really gathered pace following the election. Give us some perspective on inflation here, because yes, it's happening, and we're getting to 2 percent, and by some measures, we're past 2 percent, but there's no indication that it's running away from us, is there? Perspective is probably th the thing that's most missing, Scarlett. Look, we've sat here in this studio multiple times this year, bemoaning the failure of central banks to get inflation going again, bond yields in negative territory, and oh, there's this disinflation, deflation. No one says that anymore. No, no, that's all gone. So I like your word perspective. We're kind of missing that. Look, for all this talk, it's, we're not going back to the Volcker era, either in terms of interest rates or the rate of inflation that was required to quash that. Vince can tell you that. He was around then. <laughs> Is this anything like the Volcker era? No, yet? it's nothing like the Volcker era. One of the things you, you think, I think you need to keep in mind when you mention perspective is how poor central banks are with their long-range forecasts. Mm, yes. I mean, they're awful. We've been hearing since the financial crisis, next year inflation is going to be some 50 basis points higher than it is now, and it never gets there. So I'm not putting that much weight into this dot plot as well as I didn't the last one, and I don't think anyone else should either. <laughs> Dan, one of the most uh, striking moments uh, from Janet Yellen's press conference, uh, a surprising perhaps moment of hawkishness, was when she was asked, I think it was by uh, one of our own reporters here, about whether she wanted to see a, quote, high-pressure economy. She had talked about in October perhaps studying the merits of letting the economy run hot for a while. She sort of downplayed it. How big of a deal is that? It potentially could become quite a big deal, and Mohamed El Arian noticed this as well. Just 30 seconds of background. Our colleague Chris Condon asked her the question in the press conference about her speech in Boston in October, where she posed, to be fair, 
in a somewhat academic context the desirability of running a high pressure economy. Now he asked her about this in the press conference and she must have said about five times, I never said I wanted that, I just said it was a worthy question. Yeah, that? I never said I wanted it, it was just a worthy question. I wondered whether she was protesting too much. The question Elarian asked was, is she getting ready to walk away from that completely? Mm. She speaks Monday uh, about the labour market. That was a speech that was pretty hastily arranged, mm. or should I say, uh, scheduled very late in the day. We'll see what happens there.